Lionel Messi has agreed a two and a half year deal to join Inter Miami in Major League Soccer. Yes, I would imagine that this is the first that you're hearing of this news. You can call me Fabrizio Romano from now on. This is the second transfer of Messi's career, age 36, two years on from his first, and both have been free transfers after Messi's contracts at Barcelona and PSG expired. Messi is arguably the greatest footballer of all time, but whilst the likes of Johan Cruyff, Diego Maradona, and Cristiano Ronaldo all transferred for world record-breaking fees, Messi is almost certain now to never transfer for an actual fee. In other words, he will only ever have exchanged clubs on free transfers. That point didn't really need clarifying, did it? You had it the first time. Anyway, you can probably see where I'm going with this. Someone suggested to me that I make a video about the best footballers to have only ever transferred on freeze, in light of Messi's move, and I decided that I would. Basing it on Messi, though, I am only going to include players who transferred more than once and never commanded a fee. So someone like Pelé, who only ever played for two clubs, the second being New York Cosmos after he came out of retirement, is not eligible. I should also point out that when you go back really far to players like Jose Andrade, Jose Manuel Moreno, Giuseppe Miazza, and Gunnar Nordahl, it is practically impossible to say with any certainty or conviction what all of their transfer arrangements were and whether there were any fees involved. So I'm only going to include players who I believe, beyond all reasonable doubt, only ever transferred for free. I also won't be including Messi himself just because... That would be boring, I've already mentioned him, and he would inevitably come first. Without further ado then, here are the seven best footballers, in my view, who made multiple transfers without ever commanding a transfer fee. Seven, Steve McManaman. Steve McManaman might be about as much fun to listen to on BT Sport as your own parents having sex, sorry Steve, but he was a magnificent, and I actually think, a now massively underrated player. Had McManaman been born about 10 years later, and played during the Premier League and internet boom age, as well as in England's golden generation, I think that he would be put on a similar pedestal to the likes of Frank Lampard, Steven Gerrard, and David Beckham. Perhaps just below those three, but not far off at all. One of English football's most successful exports, McManaman controversially ran his contract down at Liverpool at the end of the 1990s, joining Real Madrid on a free, where he won six trophies, including two La Liga titles and two UEFA Champions Leagues. When McManaman returned to England after four years in Madrid, joining Manchester City, that was also on a free. Quick, creative, and incredibly gifted on the ball, McManaman was England's best player in their run to the semi-finals of Euro 96 in my view, and it borders upon criminal that he only won 37 caps. I say borders upon because, much as I think that it was a mistake, I wouldn't actually want to see anyone detained or prosecuted because of it. He was a fantastic footballer though, one of the finest dribblers that English football has ever produced, and a brilliant candidate to get us started in 7th I'm sure you'd agree. 6th, Esteban Cambiasso. I am denied over this one for a while because there is a slight caveat. Inter Milan and Argentina legend Esteban Cambiasso played for 7 different clubs and made 5 transfers over the course of his 21 years in the sport and he was never bought or sold for a transfer fee. So what's the problem? Well, River Plate apparently paid Real Madrid a €500,000 loan fee for Cambiasso in 2001, taking him on loan for a single season after he'd spent the previous three years on loan at Independiente. I suspect that this one may split opinions. It is a bit like the whole Catholic versus Protestant and Sunny versus Shia thing, insofar as it could get violent and may never be resolved, but I personally come down on the side of it being a loan fee rather than a transfer fee, and that I think that is legitimately all right and not just a technicality. It's a tricky one, all right, but the reality is that Esteban Cambiasso made three permanent transfers in total, and all three of them were on freeze. The first saw Cambiasso let go by Real Madrid, foolishly, after eight years at the club and two seasons in the first team, but their loss was most assuredly Inter Milan's gain. 
Cambiasso went on to spend 10 seasons at the San Siro, where he registered 431 appearances and won 15 trophies, including five Scudettos and the UEFA Champions League. At the age of 34, Cambiasso was on the move again, also on a free, this time joining newly promoted Leicester City. Cambiasso won the Foxes Player of the Year award as they pulled off a great escape to secure Premier League survival, but decided not to extend his stay in Leicestershire. That forced Leicester back into the transfer market, where they ended up with some French bloke called N'Golo Kante. Meanwhile, Cambiasso joined Olympiacos, where he made 49 appearances and won two Greek Super League titles in his final two seasons in the sport. If you agree with me that the loan fee doesn't count, he has to feature. If you disagree with me and think that it does, I suppose this is a terminal moment in our relationship and we should probably get a divorce. Fifth, Sol Campbell. The man behind probably the most infamous free transfer of all time, Sol Campbell didn't just join Arsenal on a free, he actually moved clubs five times without ever costing a penny. Campbell did cost a penny, a pretty penny in fact, in terms of his wages, famously becoming the first £100,000 a week player in English football when he joined Arsenal from Spurs in 2001. A bit like Steve McManaman, I think Campbell is a significantly underrated player these days by an awful lot of people, and absolutely deserves to be spoken about in the same breath as John Terry and Rio Ferdinand. An incredibly complete centre-back, who spent a couple of his early seasons routinely deputised at fullback, Campbell played over 300 games for Spurs, just shy of 200 for Arsenal, over 100 at Portsmouth, and then had very brief stints at Notts County, back at Arsenal, and finally Newcastle United. None ever paid a fee for Campbell, though it would be fair to say that they got varying degrees of bang for their buck. Arsenal, for instance, signed one of the best centre-backs in the world, who played a pivotal role in them winning six trophies, including two Premier League titles. Notts County, on the other hand, well, they got one game out of Campbell, a 2-1 defeat to Morecambe before he walked out of the club three days later, commenting that he had, quote, been a mug for believing that the Magpies were owned by ambitious billionaires and not a bunch of crooks. For more information about those crooks, who crippled the club and sent Sven-Goran Eriksson to try and carry out a trillion dollar fraud in North Korea, I have made a video all about it. It is a shameless plug, but... It's actually very interesting, so this is really a public service announcement more than anything else. Fourth, Mario Coluna. Well, I said that it gets harder to say definitively whether a player ever commanded a fee the further back you go in time, but I think that I can quite confidently say it about Mario Coluna. One of the greatest midfielders of all time, although he is all too often overlooked in such conversations, Kaluna made football look incredibly easy. Gifted, athletic, and intelligent, he was the complete midfielder. Born in Mozambique whilst it was a Portuguese colony, just like his club and international teammate Eusebio, who did once command a fee, equivalent to about €10,000, which is still enough to rule him out, Coluna was almost as important as Eusebio in turning Portugal into World Cup semi-finalists and Benfica into two-time European champions. Coluna only ever played for three clubs, Benfica, Lyon and Estrella Porto Alegre. He was already 35, or on the verge of turning 35, when he left Benfica after making 518 appearances for them, a record at the time, and now fourth in the history of the club. He spent less than a year with both Leon and Estrella Porto Alegre, so they don't really contribute to his greatness, they just mean that he fits the criteria, and is therefore eligible to feature in this seven. Third, Raul. Spain's star man throughout my childhood, when he left Real Madrid in 2010, Raul was Real Madrid, Spain, and the UEFA Champions League's all-time record goalscorer. He has since been overtaken by Cristiano Ronaldo and Karim Benzema at Real Madrid, David Villa for Spain, and Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, Robert Lewandowski, and Karim Benzema in the case of the Champions League. 
but Raul remains a legend in the game, whose goal-scoring feats are made all the more impressive because of the fact that he was often utilised as a second striker, whose creative powers were just about on par with his goal-scoring prowess. In 1994, Raul became the youngest player to ever play for Real Madrid, another record that has since been broken, and he went on to play 741 games for Los Blancos in total, perhaps the only record that he does actually still hold. It seems remarkable that someone who played that many games for Real Madrid went on to have three transfers and play for four different clubs in total, but as became a bit of a theme amongst players eligible for this seven, from Messi through to Coluna, they spent their best years at a single club, hence why they never commanded a fee, and then bounced around a couple of teams on short-term deals towards the end of their careers. Raul was 33 when he left Real Madrid, but there was still plenty of life left in him. In two seasons at Schalke, after leaving Los Blancos on a free, Raul scored 41 goals and made 20 assists in only 98 games, lifting a DFB Pokal and finishing third in the Bundesliga. Next up was Al Sadd in Qatar, where Raul scored 16 goals in 61 games before finishing his career, just like Pelé, with New York Cosmos in the North American Soccer League in 2015, where he scored 9 goals in 32 matches. Second, George Best. One of the most gifted players ever to lace up a pair of boots, when players talk about the difficulties of remaining motivated, when you reach the top and achieve virtually everything in the sport at such a young age, there are a few better examples than George Best. By the age of 22, Best had already won the First Division title, the European Cup, and the Ballon d'Or, as well as scoring 32 goals from the wing in a single season. Best's ability bewildered defenders and exhilarated crowds, who he delighted in entertaining and could sometimes prioritise given that the game came so easily to him. Unfortunately, Best was a flawed athlete and a tortured soul whose personal life blighted his legacy and career. Best suffered from alcoholism throughout most of his adult life, but particularly from the 1970s onwards. He was violent towards multiple women and was repeatedly convicted of drink driving. Following a liver transplant in 2002, Best controversially kept drinking, and in 2005, he died of a lung infection and multiple organ failure. Best had initially announced his retirement while still playing for Manchester United as a 27-year-old, but the Red Devils convinced him to stick around for another season. Best's situation on and off the pitch deteriorated significantly in the 1973-74 campaign, and he next played for Jewish Guild in South Africa, a non-league Dunstable town. Moves to Stockport County, Cork Celtic, Los Angeles Aztecs, Fulham, Fort Lauderdale Strikers, Hibernian, San Jose Earthquakes, AFC Bournemouth, and Brisbane Lions followed. He got around a bit, in every sense of the phrase rarely sticking around for long, and never acquiring a transfer fee. First, Gorincha. Lionel Messi would top this seven if I hadn't voluntarily excluded him, but he would have had some quite intense competition. Gorincha, not unlike George Best, was a spectacularly gifted wide man who burnt bright, dazzled, and amazed, but also had a tough upbringing, struggled with alcoholism, was abusive and violent towards women, and suffered a tragic demise. Born into abject poverty in the village of Pau Grange in the state of Rio de Janeiro, Garincha's father was an alcoholic, Meanwhile, he was certified as a cripple by a doctor when he was born, due to his right leg being six centimetres shorter than his left. Despite the deformity, and some have suggested perhaps even partly because of it, Garincha was extraordinarily good at football. But despite repeated requests from scouts, he refused to join a team or turn professional until his late teens. Garincha joined Botafogo at the age of 19, already married and with a child by that stage, and on his debut, having never played professional football before, he scored a hat-trick. Before long, he was playing for Brazil, with whom he won the 1958 and 1962 World Cups, and was recognised as one of the best, and perhaps the most joyous footballer in the world. When Pelé and Garincha both played, Brazil never lost a game. Garincha was 31 when he left Botafogo, going on to play briefly for Corinthians, Atletico Junior, Flamengo and Alaria, 
but by that stage, his best days were long behind him. Garincha was nicknamed the Joy of the People, but his last years were spent in misery and despair, as alcohol rendered him a mental and physical wreck before he died of liver cirrhosis at the age of 49. Still, he never commanded a transfer fee though, which is good, what with him being one of the greatest footballers of all time at all, since it means that I can include him in this seven. It swings and roundabouts, I suppose, and you've just got to take the good with the bad. Before I leave, and for the record, this video wasn't meant to be a warning about the dangers of excessive alcohol consumption, it just turned out like that, though please do drink responsibly, I will give a mention to Daniel Passarella and Socrates, both of whom I don't think ever commanded transfer fees, or at least I couldn't find definitive evidence that they ever had, and also to Gerd Muller, who probably came the closest out of anyone to featuring, only once having been signed for a transfer fee, and that fee was equivalent to just 2,000 euros. Not bad for a man who went on to score 563 goals in 605 games for Bayern Munich, but a fee is a fee, Gerd, and I'm afraid that's still enough to rule him out. I don't make the rules. I mean, I literally do, but I can't just change them on the hoof for a late great German goal-scoring machine. Anyhow, that is it for today's video. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. Apologies for my voice. I have hay fever if I sound a little bit more nasal than usual, but I hope you'll forgive me. I mean, I've taken my fexafenadine. There's not a lot more I can do, to be honest with you. Uh, hit the like button if you enjoyed the video or feel sorry for my plight. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments or just send your well wishes. And uh, of course, it goes without saying, make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications for the channel and my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens or about to appear on your screens, along with a couple of videos that you might want to watch after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.